Morning, everyone. Morning. Hey, that's pretty good. The first one's often a little bit subdued. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good to see you. It's nice to be together again, isn't it? Oh. It's, I've, I don't know about you, but I'm fed up with living my life through a little screen about this big, you know, dressed in a tie and a suit, at least to the waist. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to imagine what's below the waist for the past three years. Um, I'm not going to talk formally for 60 minutes. It's probably going to be about 30 minutes or so. But I wanted to give you time to ask questions and for us to discuss. Just to make sure everybody is in the Hokum room. OK, you're in the right room. I bet there's somebody in this room who's not <laughs> what's at the bed. <laughs> OK, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. As you've just heard, we could have probably have invented a better name means a thick heart. Yeah, hypertrophy, thick and cardiomyopathy, heart muscle problem. And for 50 years, 60 years, it's been at one level a very, very simple diagnosis. So when we see that the heart is thickened, and that that thickening is not explained by things like high blood pressure or by a narrowed valve, that's all we need to have to call it hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And what you see here is sort of, a, this is the, the heart, this is the left side, the right side, and this is the wall between the two chambers. This should be the same thickness as the back wall here. And this is one of those classical patterns that we see. So it's purely defined by clinicians by a thickening of the wall. Now, if you look back, there is, a, like all conditions, there's a sort of noble history of this. It goes back to Rome in the 17th century when there were the Pope was very concerned about young people dying suddenly and actually launched a report, which I think is still with the Department of Health awaiting approval. <laughs> William Harvey, you know, one of the great giants of, of medicine, disco discovered how the circulation works, described cases of what were clearly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. René Lenec invented the stethoscope and also was the first to use this term hypertrophy. Um, Volpien, so he's French, so we've ignored him as, as British clinicians for a couple of hundred years, but he was probably the first person to describe outflow obstruction, one of the cardinal features of, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I suppose the British story sort of starts with this guy, Donald Teer, who was a, I suppose, yeah, I would describe him as a, as a society pathologist. So he did a lot of um, famous post-mortems in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Jimi Hendrix, for example, was one of the ones he did. But he, he did like a, a little tipple, which is why he had to be driven around London in a chauffeured limo limousine. But he was a very good pathologist. And he pr did the first, I would say, modern description of this condition. Again, this thickening under the microscope, this strange arrangement we see where the cells of the heart, which are normally arranged like bricks in a wall, are much more higgledy-piggledy, what we call disarray. He described the fact that other parts of the heart can be abnormal. For example, the mitral valve, the inlet valve on the left, can be long, can be thickened. And he also showed that some areas of the heart can become scarred. Pretty much he did it in 1958. There was, long, there was long, a long period where we sort of characterized the condition using the technologies we had available to us in different eras. So it started off with the ECG and the stethoscope and then catheterization, and then echocardiography. But I would say probably the next landmark came in the, in the late 1980s. We'd, we knew that this was an inherited disease in many people. But it took until this point with the Seidman lab in Boston, my erstwhile boss, Bill McKenna, in London, studying large French-Canadian families. Now, these kind of families are a godsend for the discovery of new genes. But as you can see, it was a particularly large family. But that led to the first clue as to the cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in many people. And that cause relates to this thing. Now, I'm just going to pause and see what happens, because I use this to hypnotize an audience. <laughs> you sort of get drawn into this. What you're seeing here is a sort of a, a cartoon of what happens in all of our heart muscle cells. This is the motor which makes our cells contract. And what we have are 
This is a protein called beta-myosin heavy chain, which binds to this protein, which is called actin, and it causes these fibers to slide backwards and forwards. And it's the genes that make these proteins. That French-Canadian family was an abnormality in the gene, one of the, this gene, myosin heavy chain, which cause a lot of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I'll, I'll return to this in my, my talk this, this afternoon about therapy, because you know, another 20 years later, 30 years later, we're now starting to develop drugs which are designed to correct the abnormalities that these genetic mutations cause in this motor. Now, this was the gene discovered in the French-Canadian family, and we soon realized that didn't account for the majority of cases. And thereafter, it was a sort of a gene a year was discovered in different families. Um, most of these, in fact, all of these affected other parts of this motor mechanism. And where we are now is that we think probably maybe 40, 50, maybe as much as 60% of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have a genetic mutation in the genes that make up that motor, the sarcomere. But there are other causes for thick hearts. Some of them are new genes. Yeah, we continue to find genes which maybe account for 1% of disease. This is still going on. We described one, another one last year. There's also a long list of conditions which can cause a thick heart. Many of these are very rare. Some of these are rare because we don't look for them. And I suppose the poster child for this at the moment is a group of conditions called amyloidosis. And amyloidosis is another family of diseases where you get abnormal proteins laid down inside the heart. It's a disease predominantly of people over the age of 50, mostly over the age of 70, more men than women, but affects both. Can be inherited, rarely. I say rarely, um, three to 5% of West African descent carry a variant which can predispose them to amyloidosis. So actually, in some respects, it's one of the most common genetic conditions around. Um, one of the reasons we have to start looking for this is there is an, a treatment available for this now. Something else that we're learning is that you, know, you may inherit a genetic mutation, but whether it actually manifests itself will depend on other genes that you inherit, but may also depend upon other more common conditions, and in particular things like high blood pressure or obesity. And indeed, if you look at people who have thick hearts and also have, they're a bit overweight, they, they tend to have thicker hearts. If you look at people here who are a bit overweight, they tend to have more obstruction when they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we're seeing an interaction between common conditions and the underlying genetics. And of course, this provides us potentially with some non-pharmacological lifestyle ways of improving symptoms and the manifestations of the disease. So just to consider a few things about this condition. Now, this one, this it sounds a bit weird, isn't it? How common is it? But you know, we're still not absolutely sure. Um, I put this up just to re remind me. So this guy, and I'm struggling to find a picture of him. Wallace Brigden was the first person to use the term cardiomyopathy. So if you don't like the name, he's the guy you've got to, you've got to blame. But he invented it for a very particular reason, because in his era, which again was sort of 1950s, people were using all sorts of terms to describe heart muscle conditions, which were totally inappropriate. And he said, we need to highlight that there is a group of conditions out there which are not caused by coronary disease or high blood pressure. But then he was saying, you know, we, we don't know how common these things are, but I think they're probably more common than we actually suspect. And one of the reasons that we've perhaps missed it is because clinicians, certainly in this era, and even when I was training, there was a reluctance to use the word cardiomyopathy. I suppose it comes from sort of a more parochial, more not parochial, paternalistic approach to medicine, where they're there, my dear, yeah, I'll sort this out and we won't tell you what you have. Because if I tell you you've got cardiomyopathy, as you heard in the room just now, oh my God, you know, if I tell them that, they're going to think they're going to die. We don't want to frighten them. There's a number, and you may have read this, and it's certainly 
um, the Dr. Google number, which is that hypertrophic coenopathy occurs in one in 500 of the population. Now that number comes from, yeah, if I took an echo machine out onto Bishopsgate and I scanned young adults walking past, I would find that one in 500 of them have a thick heart muscle. But they're usually very well, have no symptoms, and probably never will have. So I think it, the number is probably correct, but it doesn't necessarily relate to the people who are developing symptoms and coming into the system, as it were. And if you look at people within the system, this is something we've done recently, looking at the electronic health records in the UK. And rather than one in 500, our best guess is three to four per 10,000, or one in 3,000 of the population. But these are the people presenting with chest pain, breathlessness, having operations, having defibrillators, all that kind of thing. So I think it's somewhere between the two. This slide shows you how that prevalence in the electronic health record has changed over time. And actually, the prevalence has increased by almost 60%. Now, I don't think that's because hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or indeed any of the other cardiomyopathies have become more common. But this is the point about doctors being easier with the term. <laughs> Saying that someone has a cardiomyopathy, whether it be dilated or hypertrophic or arrhythmogenic. And in a way, this is a good sign. Yeah, it shows that, and also probably reflects better diagnostics, better access to diagnostics. And in terms of the approaches to diagnosis, um, so I'm probably the last of an era of cardiologists because I talk to patients. <laughs> That's unfair, <laughs> a little, but I examine them. And that I was taught in an era when we didn't have MRIs. Yeah, it was really hard, actually it was hard getting an echocardiogram. So I was taught classically to you know, find all these signs and when I examine a patient. And in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, if you have outflow tract obstruction, actually, it's not that hard to diagnose. But this is a dying art. But I still show it to my colleagues, and because it's, you know, if you've got someone who's young, chest pain, abnormal ECG, and they've got a heart murmur, they do need to be referred for evaluation. This is, again, maybe a little bit of an old-fashioned test in some people's mind, the electrocardiogram but it's probably the most sensitive test that we have. So it's non-specific. You know, each spike here is a heartbeat. These different labels on the screen here are the different leads that we stick on you. I'm sure many of you had ECGs. And this is abnormal. The spikes are a bit big. This part is a bit saggy. But again, if you've seen someone and, you, and you've, they've got chest pain, you've, they've got a heart murmur, they've got an ECG like this, you're already about 40 or 50% of the way to making a diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Of course, the clincher is taking a picture of the heart. And all these terms that we use, hypertrophic, dilated, restrictive, are basically descriptions of what we see when we take a picture of the heart. So what you're seeing here is an ultrasound. This is the left ventricle. This is the left atrium, one of the top chambers of the heart. So blood's coming in through this thing opening and closing, which is the mitral valve. And then it goes out around the body through this, which is the aortic valve. And do you remember that slide I showed you right at the beginning where you had that thickening of the wall between the left and the right? Well, this is what you're seeing here. That's the right, that's the left, and here's this very thick heart muscle. We can do other things. We can look at how the heart contracts. Um, that's what this is doing. This is what's called strain imaging. That sometimes helps us pick up some of the rarer things like amyloidosis. But probably the biggest development in cardiac imaging for the past 20 years has been magnetic resonance imaging. Has any, any of you been in the scanner? Not a very nice test, is it, really? No. no it's, it's a bit like putting your head in a bucket and have someone hit it with a hammer. But <laughs> it does give us nice images of the heart. It images parts of the heart which are quite difficult to see with ultrasound, particularly the right ventricle. But the other thing is, when you had your MRI, you probably had an injection in the back of the hand, and that 
It's a particular substance called gadolinium, which acts like a dye. And that shows us areas of fibrosis. And it can also show us, again, patterns like this, where the whole heart is sort of diffusely enhanced. And this is very typical of amyloidosis, again. We can even, without injecting contrast, look at things like the fat content of the heart muscle, which is abnormal in some cardiomyopathies. This is a rare, another one of those rare causes of a thick heart it's called Fabry's disease or Anderson Fabry disease. And again, there's a particular signal on MRI. So I'm sure it's the wider use application of MRI, which again is improving the numbers of people being detected with this condition. We've also got some other funny tests that we're starting to use a lot more. Again, I, I keep coming back to this condition, amyloidosis. Um, but what you see here, no, no clues for this, but this is, this is a bone scan. Okay, that's what the bones are lighting up. So this would be used for looking for tumors in the bone or infection in the bone, that sort of thing. But if you look here, as well as the bones lighting up, the heart's lit up. And this is very, very typical of a particular form of amyloidosis, which is part of the normal aging process, but which can present as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in older, in older people. So greater awareness, new imaging techniques are helping us to not only pick the disease up, but to try to determine the underlying cause for the condition. What about the principles of treatment? Well, I think as a cardiologist, as a, as a sort of specialist in heart conditions. And I'm sure for you as well, when you go to the, you know, you're told you've got the diagnosis, the emphasis is often, as it should be, I suppose, on the, the bad things that can happen with this disease. And this is true pretty much of any of the cardiomyopathies to a greater or lesser extent. So what you will read about is sudden cardiac death. You'll read about possibly progressive heart failure. You'll read about, this, this is another word for stroke. But of course, you know, that it's not just about those things. And actually, the biggest challenge with cardiomyopathies is living with the damn thing. Because, yeah, OK, it gives you limiting symptoms, but that's a problem. Yeah, if you're young and you've got young kids, you can't kick a football around with your son. It's a real pain in the bum not being able to get up a flight of stairs and being breathless. Can't go down to the shops. All of the stuff that you have to do to operate in your normal life. It inter that will interfere with your personal relationships, simply because you're, you as a person have changed, but also if you're a parent and your relationship with the kids. Have I passed this on? Employment. If you, this is one of the, uh, yeah, we, we obviously screen people, we screen families when someone is diagnosed, but I always warn my colleagues, before you screen someone, before you do an echo and an ECG, just make sure that individual understands the implications of their diagnosis. So they make an informed decision about whether they want to know. You know, for, for me as a doctor, a, bit, a little bit evangelical, of course they want to know, you know, we want to save them. You know, but if they're a firefighter, or if they're in another high risk occupation, they're gonna lose their job. HGV driver, they're gonna lose their job. If you're already in a sort of a non-high risk um, occupation, now I'm sure you've all told your employers that you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, right? There's one honest person in the room. <laughs> but often people don't. Because, you know, externally you look normal, you can function, you can do a job. Um, if you tell your employer they shouldn't discriminate against you because you've got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but of course you and I know that Discrimination can be very subtle, or not so subtle. Life insurance, have you all been through that? Trying to get life insurance? The computer says no. So, and of course the psych psychological, which are often very individual, and how you cope with having a condition. So yes, it's about sudden death, stroke, and heart failure, but it's also about all this kind of stuff. And that's why organizations like Kind of the UK are so important, because that's the bit that they're better at, I think, than we are in short consultations in outpatients where we see people once or twice a year. And it's why my, my own personal approach, and it, I think my colleagues too, is when I, when I see someone for the first time with this condition, I tend to sort of talk about it in a series of boxes. So I talk about the implications of, yeah, what is it that you've got? 
What are the implications for your family, insurance, employment, etc.? I talk about their symptoms and what the mechanism of their symptoms might be and how we might be able to improve them. And then I talk about the risk of complications. And of course, each of these things are related, but the conversations can be quite discreet. And I think it's important to systematically go through each of these things. Now, I know most of you are not cardiologists, but will you agree with me that's not a good rhythm to have? Um, this is the only example I can recall. We do a lot of exercise tests, and there's often, um, amongst my colleagues and the physiologists who do the exercise tests, a reluctance to ex exercise people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And in, I don't know, whatever it is now, 30 years or more, this is the only example I've got of someone having an arrhythmia on an exercise test. Was it a 20-year-old footballer with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? No. It was a rather irascible 65-year-old lawyer who'd had a couple of fainting episodes. And we put him on this and he, he blacked out here. And then it took me a week to persuade him to have a defibrillator. Dear boy, I've been blacking out for years. <laughs> Do you know what? We put the defibrillator in and it's never gone off. I would be such a rich man if I betted on the, the defibrillator going off. There is this thing about, you know, this, he wouldn't have survived this. <laughs> if it hadn't have happened in hospital. And we put defibrillators in, and for many people with defibrillators, they never have another event. Or their next event, maybe 10 years later, or 15 years later. Complete mystery. Fortunately, and I think this is a, this is a point I really emphasize when I see people for the first time. You know, if you go on to Google, what you're gonna see is that. It's all about people dropping dead suddenly. But remember where I started, you know, about how common this disease is. Well, if it's one in 500 or one in 3,000, I can promise you we don't have swathes of people in the population dropping dead from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If you look at the dark bars here, this is from a large European consortium, and look at different age groups. The risk for sudden death sort of peaks in the 20s and 30s and then gradually declines as you get older. There is a little bit of a difference between men and women. So in men, this line is sort of the background risk in the population. Men sort of, are, on average, it's, you, know, you have to individualize the risk, but on average, the risk of sudden death sort of gets to the background around 60 years of age in men. But it remains a little excessive in women beyond that sixth decade. The, the positive thing about this is that if we can identify individuals who are at high risk, we've got a very powerful way of protecting them. Has anybody got a defibrillator in? Has anybody got this kind of defibrillator in where you don't have a lead inside the heart? What's called an SICD. So you've probably got, I was gonna say old fashioned one. It's not an old fashioned one. <laughs> but 95% of people with defibrillators will have a, a box up here, as you, as you described, with wires that go into a vein under the collarbone, usually or sometimes a wire in the top chamber and a wire in the bottom chamber. So that's a conventional, what we call dual chamber ICD. And they are very effective at protecting people. I mean, the procedure itself is done under local with a bit of sedation. It's a low risk procedure. The long term problems with these devices, you have to have the box changed periodically because you know, although it costs the same as a small car, um, it is basically a clever battery that has to be replaced. The problems long term, and by long term I mean five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, are with the leads. So if the leads fail, then we're faced with the dilemma of do we leave the old ones in and put some new ones down the side, or do we take out the old ones? And the, the trend now is to remove the old ones because you do eventually run out of space. But lead extraction does carry a small risk. And so there are, what the companies are trying to do is to find ways of avoiding putting leads inside the heart. And this is the, the latest sort of uh, solution to that, which is a box, rather than going up here, goes on the side of the chest, and the wire is then tunneled under the skin along the side of the breastbone, so it doesn't actually go into the heart. 
and we're putting a lot of these things in now, it's, it's not quite the same as this device. So if you also need the device to pace the heart, this one can't do that. It is bigger. So this sort of device is sort of that size, whereas the SICD is about that big. Um, but we can sort of tuck it under the muscle at the side here. But um, there's a lot of sort of technical development going on to try and find ways of protecting the heart with a shock, what we call a shock box, but not having to put any wires inside the heart. Now, how do we find those people who are at risk? Um, now, there is an approach for other diseases, people who are at risk of stroke are when they go into atrial fibrillation, or people who are at risk of getting coronary disease if they've got high cholesterol and they smoke too much, et cetera. We have tools that we have available on computers in clinics and general practice surgeries which say this person's risk of developing a heart attack in the next five years is X. And a few years ago, we said, well, why don't we do that for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy too? So we can talk around a number in the clinic rather than just saying, I think you're at risk. And there's the tool that we developed. So it looks at what we call major risk factors we've been established for years. So age, how thick the heart is, how big that top chamber is. Do you have obstruction? Do you have a bad family history? Have you got funny rhythms on your tape? Have you blacked out? And we can use that, and this is now based on 8,000 people, I think, to come up with a number. So I can say to you, look, our best guess is that in the next five years, you've got a three in a hundred chance of something happening, or a six in a hundred chance of something happening. And then we talk about what that means for you. Because everybody's got a different perception of risk. You know, when we created this tool, um, we, there's a recommendations box here which says defibrillator is indicated, may be indicated, not indicated. But risk is a very, very personal thing. And I think our job is to make sure that as much as we possibly can, we've explained what that risk is, and then we have a conversation about whether or not you do or don't have a defibrillator. That's the sort of algorithm. These were the number, when we did this, and that was part of a, a guideline document, yeah, we came up with these thresholds. So if you've got less than 4% at five years, no. That greater than 6%, yes. But where do you think these numbers came from? Yeah, Moses did not descend from the mountain. And on the 11th tablet, it said, thou shalt put a defibrillator in when it reaches 6%. I was there. I know how it happened. It was 20 blokes and one woman sitting around the table. I say, what do you think? 6%? Mm, yeah, sounds right. Well, I think it should be higher than that. What about 8%? Mm, no, I, I prefer it to be 4%. There is no such thing as acceptable risk. Definition. That's what I mean. It's very personalized. So the risk thing, the risk of dying suddenly, we have got good tools now which can identify most people who are at risk, and we have methods for protecting them. Now, what about symptoms? You know, a lot of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy get chest pain on exertion or chest tightness. There's an interesting one, isn't it, about the communication between doctors and patients. So the, when I say, have you got chest pain, is a different question to do you get tightness in the chest? Because some people don't equate the tightness with pain. Palpitations. I bet you've all got a different idea as to what a palpitation is. When Medics say that to you. What they're referring to is, are you aware of abnormal heartbeats, like skipped beats, extra beats, rapid beats? But sometimes people use that term palpitation to describe breathlessness, or just a strange sensation in the chest when you do stuff. Probably about one in four people, perhaps more, who have exertional symptoms have this problem, left ventricular outflow obstruction. Now, you're all experts in echocardiography now. So this is the left ventricle. This is the left atrium, the top chamber blood going in through this valve. And do you see what that valve's doing when it shuts? As it shuts, it sort of does that and bends forwards with each heartbeat. Do you see that? And this is the outflow to the heart. So the valve is actually getting in the way of blood as it passes out of the heart. So when we talk about obstruction in this disease, 
That's what we're talking about. And everybody thinks it's the muscle that obstructs it. Of course, if you've got a thick muscle, it's, it's contributing to this, but it's actually the valve that's being pushed into the muscle, which is the problem. Like that. So how do we treat this? Well, if you, if you give drugs which, if you like, reduce the force with which the heart beats, that often reduces this drive to push the valve into the muscle. So th who's on a beta blocker? Do you like them? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, beta blockers are used for many things. They're used for treating angina, high blood pressure, migraine, anxiety, all sorts of things. We use them in this context, again, to reduce the force of contraction of the heart. And they can be very effective. Some people are intolerant of them, or they just don't work. So we have another drug called verapamil. Anybody taking that? Hmm. Okay. The numbers of people on verapamil have been slowly declining, I would, I would say, over the years. But it's a different kind of drug. It's called a calcium antagonist. But it does the same thing. It reduces the force of contraction. And then if I, these drugs are not effective on their own, we sometimes add disapyramide. Now, who's on disapyramide? Have you had troubles getting it? Yeah, yeah. It's actually a drug we use for controlling heart rhythm, what we call antiarrhythmic. Um, because we don't use many antiarrhythmics anymore, the market for this has disappeared. So there are actually very few companies making it now. Um, but we use it because almost as a side effect, it reduces the force of contraction of the heart. Now, many people will respond to one or more of these drugs. The problem is they've all got side effects. So beta blockers make you feel tired and lethargic, slow down your brain a bit. Um, I remember I had to take them for a while, and I had to stop them, because I would find myself in the morning, I'd be standing in the hall <coughs> to go out to work, and I'd just be, so um, where are my keys? Um, where are my keys? OK. Um, where was I going? Oh, I was going off to work. Yeah, it just, it, just, it just slows the whole lot down. People get used to it after a while, but it's, you know, it's one of those pay, prices you pay for being on a beta blocker. For Apamil, it gives you swollen ankles and constipates you. Does a pyramide, gives you dry eyes, dry mouth, and constipates you. And if you're on for Apamil and does a pyramide, well, you know. Just give up. Give up. <laughs> that was not open till Christmas sort of thing. So the, you, everybody has their own experience with these drugs, but it's not, they're not, not the cure for the symptoms in many people. And that's why in some people we go to what we call septal reduction therapy. So try to reduce the thickening of that wall between the two chambers. So this rather lurid <laughs> picture shows you the surgical approach to this problem which is to take a, a chunk out of the muscle, that bulge, you know, which was adjacent to that valve being pushed forwards. Now, when we do the operation, we don't open the heart in that, that way. It is on bypass. Is that one of my surgical colleagues? The, uh, but what they actually do is to open up the aorta and look down through the valve, so the hole is only about that big, and remove this muscle from above. It's a really difficult operation. Mr. Cipollini, who's going to be talking here today, is, works with us. He's probably one of the few surgeons that's done a lot of these in the UK, and it's a hard operation to do. This is, a, this, this is often shown in review articles about this, where the surgeons get what I call a Michelangelo complex. You know, ch -ch -ch, I'm going to take away the muscle. Um, it's actually very rarely like this, and not, I would say, advisable in most people. But this operation, if you select people properly, can be very effective. But it is a heart operation. And for that reason, yeah, there have been explorations for other ways of trying to thin the muscle. This is the other one that we use predominantly, which is called an alcohol septal ablation. So there what we do is we put a catheter, usually from the top of the leg or from the wrist, up to the heart into that main artery which runs down the heart. So those of you who've had an angiogram, you would have had the catheter and then dye squirted down that artery. 
what we do in alcohol sept ablation is the same thing, but then we put a little tube with a balloon on the end into the branch that supplies that bulge, and then we squirt medical alcohol into that to try and chemically create what the surgeon does with his knife. Now, this is a less invasive procedure, but the, the choices, whether you go just for medical therapy alone or whether you go for surgery or, or alcohol septuplation, is more than just, you know, what do you fancy? It's partly patient choice, but it also depends upon your risks, whether your coronary anatomy allows us to get to that bulge, um, whether there are other problems. So I've shown you the thickening, but often the valve, as I've said several times, is abnormal. And if a valve is very long, you can't fix that by squirting alcohol into the muscle. That requires a surgical approach. As so I'll talk a little bit more about this afternoon, this is, you heard mention of a new drug for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a drug called Mavacamptin. And that comes back to my little hypnotic tool here, where one of the problems in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is that this ratchet mechanism is a bit overactive. It's squeezing too hard. And that, the heart responds to that by thickening. So Mavacamptin works by inhibiting this ratchet mechanism. So the heart is less squeezy. So in some respects, it's exactly like what we do in, with beta blockers or disapyramide. The thing about MAVA is it doesn't have all those other side effects. And we now have a randomized trial, which is, yeah, I've been doing hocomology for 30 years. We don't do randomized trials in this disease. <laughs> but we've now got one which shows that you can reduce the obstruction, you can improve the symptoms, you can improve the exercise capacity, and you can re reduce the, the concentration of some hormones in the blood which tell you the heart's under stress. Not everybody responds. It's not a panacea, but it does seem to be substantially better than beta blockers and these other drugs. It is not available in the UK. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit later, but it's, it's being reviewed by NICE next year. We'll see. So I've talked about the sudden death. I've spoken about heart failure symptoms related to obstruction, so breathless and so on. Just to mention this, this very important one, which sometimes gets overlooked, is stroke risk. Um, and stroke risk is caused, strokes are caused in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy by the fact that top chamber of the heart, the atrium, enlarges. And if you look at the risk of stroke, it relates directly to the size of the atrium. And the reason you get a stroke in hokum is because as your heart, get, the atrium gets bigger, it becomes more prone to a rhythm called atrial fibrillation. So the top chamber, rather than beating in time with the bottom, just does that. And while it's doing that, you can develop clots inside the atrium, which if they leave the heart, can cause a stroke. So if we have anybody with atrial fibrillation, they should be on a blood thinner. And these days, one of what we call diacs, so a pixaban, a doxaban. Um, if someone has a very big atrium, then occasionally we will also anticoagulate them, even if we haven't documented atrial fibrillation, because it's likely they're going to go into AF at some point. I'll show you this slide because this, this again is from the electronic health record. Um, now, you have to be a little bit cautious about this because the identification of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy from the record can be a bit tricky. But when we did this, we looked at the number of people with a, what we thought was a diagnosis of HCM who had a history of atrial fibrillation who were receiving anticoagulants, and it was only about a quarter. Now, there may be good reasons for people not receiving a blood thinner, Maybe they've got a bleeding tendency for some reason. But we, we, we suspect that many people who should be on a blood thinner are not. And then finally, um, this coming back to the heart failure thing. So I say heart failure symptoms, breathlessness, et cetera, in many people are caused by this obstruction problem. An awful lot of people with hokum have a breathlessness. So yeah, maybe 60 70% will have breathlessness on exertion. And actually, although the focus in the literature and you know, what you hear and read about this condition is on the sudden death issue, 
If you look at what happens over the course of a lifetime, and this is from a large registry, predominantly in North America, yes, yeah, this is sudden death equivalent. It does happen, yeah, cumulatively, but the big problem is progressive heart failure. Because this is a heart muscle condition. And some people, fortunately not everybody, but some people will get progressive deterioration in their function. And it doesn't happen over a year or two years, but it happens over five or 10 or 15 or 20 years. So the, the, the big, I would say, frontier now in the treatment of all cardiomyopathies, including HCM, is to develop new ways of preventing this deterioration in function. Now, we've had all sorts of different drugs, drugs that are used for you know, treating heart failure in other contexts, drugs like ranolazine, which does a number of things like improve the blood flow to the heart, but none of these other drugs have really done much. But this is the excitement now in cardiomyopathy land. You know, as I've been doing, I've been a cardiomyopathy kind of person for 30 years, and up until about five years ago, I hardly ever spoke to the drug industry because they didn't really make drugs that were specific to cardiomyopathy. Now it's conversations every week because billions are now being invested by the different companies to develop new therapies to treat hypertrophic, dilated, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Trying to treat the underlying mechanism of disease. In some cases, maybe even trying to correct the underlying genetic defect. Now, will this stuff work? I don't know. Mavacamptin has worked. The other interesting thing about Mavacamptin is not only does it reduce obstruction, but it seems to do other things in the heart muscle. There's a bit of evidence suggesting it may cause the heart muscle to reduce in thickness. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Don't know yet. But it's doing more than just reducing obstruction. So <laughs> watch this space, OK? Because there's a lot happening in cardiomyopathy. And I think you know, every reason to be confident that in five years' time or 10 years' time, the conversation about how we treat these conditions is going to be very different. I'll stop there. Questions? Well, <laughs> yep. Can I just say, um, I've, I've had a, an ICD inside myself for about 25 years. Yeah. That's the best hour I've ever heard of Hokan. So much. Thank, thank you very much for that. And mm -hmm. I mean, I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry, so I would like to think I've quite well clued up these things. But now it was, that was excellent. So thank you very much for it. Um, I was just quitting. I was going to come through. So as I'm getting older, because I've got a few grey hairs, um, you were talking there about the you know, sort of, uh, treatment of stroke, that yeah. increase of stroke. I was just wondering, someone who's got hokum, yeah. should you, uh, should, if you're unfortunate enough to have stroke, should that treatment of a, a stroke patient with hokum be a bit different to the average member of the population? Not particularly. I mean, people with hokum are prone to stroke for all the reasons that people without hokum are. So if you've got high blood pressure, if you've got... Yeah, atherosclerosis, furring up your arteries. People with hokum are not immune to those kind of things. But the commonest reason for stroke in certainly sort of younger people, and by, by that I mean sort of middle-aged people, is atrial fibrillation. So it's, you know, it, fortunately it doesn't happen very often now, but it's, for me it's a tragedy when we go through this whole process of assessment and we assess someone's risk of dying suddenly and we put in a defibrillator and then they have a stroke. When in fact, you know, the atrium was big, they were getting little runs of atrial fibrillation. By putting someone on anticoagulant, that could have been prevented, probably. So it's, the reason I mention it is just to sort of alert people to this possibility. So the next time they go to clinic, ask the cardiologist, what's the size of my left atrium, please? Thank you. And uh, I've got another 50-year-old question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Pleasure. If I start here, I'll come round as you put your hands up. So Thank you. Hello. Um, can you explain to me what um, Widowmaker syndrome is? Because every time I go to A&E in my local area and they do an ECG, they sort of panic and keep mentioning Widowmaker. <laughs> I won't ask you which A&E you go into. I mean, if it's, uh, yeah, there's an, uh, that's meant to put you at your ease. In. <laughs> 
I suspect what they're referring, I don't know for sure, but I suspect what they're referring to is, the, is a particular ECG pattern, which is very typical of, an, of a blockage in the main artery running down the front of the heart, what we call LAD syndrome. No, you don't. But I'm sure many people in, in the room have experienced this. When they, you go to A&E or someone goes to A&E, and they, they do the ECG and everybody starts running around like, yeah, crazy, because <gasps> the patient's having a heart attack. You go, no, no, my ECG's always like this. No, 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 we've got to do it. Yeah, because the ECGs look scary in A&E when someone comes to the chest pain. So I suspect it's you go there, they look at the ECG and think, oh, my God, this person is having a heart attack. And that's what that means. I think that's probably what they mean, but next time you go there, tell them to stop using that term. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, is this on? No, it's not. Uh, firstly, thank you for a fantastic presentation. I think we'll all agree that you've made some quite complex data very accessible, so thank you. One of your slides, um, you indicated that the greatest incidence of sudden cardiac death was in those in their 20s and 30s yeah. over other age groups. Is there any understanding as to why? No, there isn't. I mean, I think so. there are some... For me, having sort of studied this disease for such a long time, in a way, I... I'm mystified why sudden cardiac death isn't a greater problem than it is. Because if you were to design a heart that would have a cardiac arrest every day, it would be a hokum heart because it's thick, it's got a lot of scar, and you've got this, disarran this abnormal arrangement of the cells. But most of the time, it sits there quietly doing its job. And the events, again, you know, we have this concern appropriate about things that might trigger an arrhythmia, like intense exercise, those kind of things. But actually, the rare events that do occur often happen when people are not doing very much. So why these events happen when they do, you know, 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday in June, we just don't understand. But I think what it re represents is that the, that the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart is, is a very well-compensated thing. So it's, it's got all these reasons not to function properly but it adapts, and it's a very, very well-adapted heart, which is why most of the time it doesn't cause problems. But if you just tip the balance a little bit, then it can go off and cause an arrhythmia. I mean, the tool that I've showed you for predicting risk, it does identify the majority of people who have an event, but the majority of the people in the high-risk group never have an event. So it's just how all, all of our risk tools for most medical conditions are imperfect in that sense. And the trade-off there is it means we have to put in a lot of defibrillators to save one life. So it's, on average, it's about 16 defibrillators to save one life. Hello there. Um, I wondered if you could explain the connection between heart murmur and HCM. Mm -hmm. And I have a bit of a hearing loss, so I don't mind if you shout at me. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so all a heart murmur means is a sound that we hear when we put a stethoscope on the chest. So normally, I, I, I was just talking to one of my colleagues, I really must get a recording that I can play to you guys next, for next year. But you know, when, when, you, when, I, when you put a stethoscope on the chest, you hear the, the valves closing. It's the classic lub-dub, you know. Can I do it? Okay. Now, if you've got... Shh, shh, that's a heart murmur. And all it means is that you have turbulence. And that can be through a narrowed valve. It can be through a hole in the heart. The, reason you, the reasons you get a murmur in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is because as that valve comes forwards, it causes obstruction and turbulence, which we hear as a whooshing sound. And the other reason you get a or other common reason you get a murmur in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is as that valve moves forwards, it separates slightly, and you get a little bit of a leak back through the valve. And we can also hear that. So all a murmur means is a, is a sound, a turbulent flow in the heart. And that can be caused by narrow valves, that say holes, or the kind of things I've described today. Does that make sense? Hello there. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, um, my son is in his 20s. He's, he's low risk and has been monitored over the last four years. But the consultant has really changed her mind in view of American um, information that's come mm -hmm. over to impact on that risk <laughs> um, due to the contrast, I think you mentioned yeah. there, 
And I just wondered what your views were on that. Yeah, I was a bit naughty, actually, because I should have put in a slide showing the American guidelines, which actually I'm an author of, too. Um, so, look, for the... For 20, 30 years, what we've done to try to determine whether someone is at risk is we, we look for features of the disease which we, think, which we know or think associate with a higher risk. So if you've got a really thick heart muscle, then the risk is probably higher. If you're getting runs of extra beats from the ventricle, what we call non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, that is associated with a higher risk. If you've had blackouts, which are not explained by an obvious cause, that is associated with higher risk. And the approach we had until we developed this model was to say, okay, well, the more of those things that you have, the higher is the risk, and then we have to sort of make a judgment as to whether or not we put a defibrillator in. The problem with that approach is that it was not quantitative in any way whatsoever. I couldn't say whether your risk was 1% or 5% or I just think it's high. I couldn't put a number on it which is why we developed this. Now, in the US guidelines, um, they, the, they don't like the use of this calculator because they don't really believe it, many cardiologists in the US. Um, but what they suggest is that one, two, three, four risk factors. And, and my argument has always been, well, look, we're using the same risk factors. The only difference is that we're trying to give you a number that you can then discuss with the patient. So there is a figure which I haven't put in my presentation where they have a, a flow chart sort of like this. So they say if you've got any one of these things, then a defibrillator is reasonable. And then there's like a little arrow with a tiny little asterisk, which if you go to the footnote on page 466, says, and you might sometimes want to do the, the risk calculator. But it was very interesting. Um, I, I probably can break all sorts of confidences now, but... When we had the discussion, and it was quite an animated discussion in the US guideline, the person who advocated for a tool was the patient representative. And her argument was, look, you know, I hear the debate you're having, but if there's information out there which allows me to decide whether I want a defibrillator, I want all that information, please. So if there's a score, tell me what that score is, and then we can have a discussion about whether or not you or I think that's relevant to my decision making. Um, I remain absolutely wedded to this. I think this, this for me is a very, you can have an intelligent, informed discussion about risk built around a number rather than a feeling. Sorry, for caveat. So the Americans use all this. They've got a couple of other things they add to the list. Yeah, sorry, I should have said that. So to this list, they also add scar on the MRI, and they also add something called an aneurysm. So sometimes in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, down at the tip of the heart, you develop a little outpouching. And some, they believe strongly that that's associated with an increased risk based on... <laughs> sorry. Uh, really, really, really quick one. So not a question. Um, Thank you for the talk. Um, jumping back to the uh, A&E question about abnormal ECG, something yeah. Bill McKenna advised me years ago was carry an old copy. And it has say, I've seen paramedics look very worried and then I dig this crumpled piece of paper out of my warfarin book and, <laughs> oh yeah, it's odd, but it's your odd. Yeah. And, you know, save myself a few admissions on that. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, with iPhones and stuff, scan it and keep it on an iPhone. Absolutely, and it's always very good advice. Hi, I'm David. I've come here from Guernsey. <clears throat> I have Hocum, and it didn't set off till I was 62. Although I have, looking back, I can see signs that I had it like fainting. I was a fainter. Um, my legs got swollen. But I had this major life changing incident when I was 62. And Immediately, it kicked off my um, uh, weight ballooned up, and it led to a diagnosis of hokum. So, is is there a link between sort of life events and stress and and, uh, and hokum? Um, it depends 
What do you mean by life event? Not, not in the same way as there is, for example, with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, there's clearly a relationship between physical or emotional stress and, and episodes in the disease where it becomes hot, if you like. And I, I don't think we've got a clear relationship between HCM and that. But of course, if you're under pressure, then symptoms which may have been there latent or which you've sort of become accustomed to may become more prominent if you're putting the cardiovascular system under stress. So my guess is, is that is probably why that, that, those two events are associated. The fact that you develop the disease when you're 62 is not unusual. So you know, it's a genetic disease in many people, not everybody, but in many people. But the age at which the heart thickens up can be enormously variable. So it can appear when you're very young, quite unusual below the age of 10, but it does happen. Um, it can appear in your 20s, your 30s, but it can appear for the first time when you're 50 or 60. The oldest person I've ever seen who we knew was carrying a genetic mutation, whose echo and ECG went from normal to abnormal, was 84. So it's, it's an extreme range. Now, what, what are the triggers? You know, why does it appear at the age of 62? Well, it, there's, uh, it's still a bit of a mystery. It may be the interaction, as I say, between other things like high blood pressure or weight and so on. Um, but it, this late onset form is very well recognized. <laughs> we will get to you, I promise. <laughs> I had a ICD fitted last year, and I was very interested about what you were saying about the new drugs in the future. Mm. If these new job, drugs become available, would I or anybody be able to have the ICD removed? Would Great. the new drugs re do the same thing? Great Thank question. you. Great question. So this is... Um, this is an interesting one, and it's one that the, the drug industry is thinking about a lot. Um, if you, because it would be great, wouldn't it, to have a therapy, whether it's a drug or gene therapy, which effectively cures the disease so that you're no longer prone to life-threatening arrhythmias or atrial fibrillation. Um, I think it's going to be a very long time before we reach the point with any therapy that we're confident that we've lowered the risk of having a life-threatening arrhythmia. And one of the reasons for that is because the event rates are very low anyway. So to prove it in a, in a trial, I think it's almost impossible. Because you'd have to study thousands and thousands of people and follow them probably for a decade, which is a very difficult thing to do in a trial context. So the companies are struggling with what you measure in a trial. So I showed you the, the Explorer trial, which was looking at hypertrophic, looking at the, I'm sorry, no, the obstruction problem. And this trial wasn't looking at prognosis. All it was looking at was symptoms. Um, and until relatively recently, the, the licensing authorities didn't really like that very much for licensing a new cardiac drug. What they want is a reduction in sudden death or heart failure or stroke. And so that's going to be hard in all cardiomyopathies. Um, now, it may be that some of the new therapies that are being tested or will be tested have a dramatic effect on the heart. You know, if, if you'd asked me the kind of hearts I've been showing you today, I would have said that that's irreversible. <coughs> yeah, how can you get rid of all that thickening? How can you get rid of all that scar? But we might be wrong. You know, we actually don't know what the new drugs or what gene therapy is capable of until we do it. So I think, as I say, watch this space, we don't know. But I think the, to get the confidence that we don't have to put defibs in is going to be a little way off yet, probably for the people coming after me. Um, thank you very much for a, a great presentation. Um, I just wondered, does risk increase with diabetes? Hmm, good question. It does, it's, some of the symptoms are worse in people who have hokum and diabetes. We don't know about risk as such, but there is, just as with high blood pressure, there is an interaction between diabetes and maybe the severity of the symptoms and, and the condition itself. We, we, as I say, we don't know its impact on, on prognosis. 
Uh, thanks, Professor. Um, I'm relatively new to the world of HCM, and I was diagnosed a couple of years ago, but um, uh, my consultant was fairly happy that I would just be on statins and aspirin and have checkups because I'm asymptomatic. Um, through a referral through my GP, I've seen another cardiologist, and I've had a completely different um, uh, it's, it's, the, the, the result, the science is the same, the, 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 the therapy is different. And now I'm being quite strongly encouraged to have an ICD to go on blood thinners. Um, and I went back to my original cardiologist and he said, no, you don't need to do any of that. And it's a very strange and lonely world when you're getting such differing opinions from two cardiologists, two reputable cardiologists. And um, I'm just wondering the reason why the ICD was recommended by the second cardiologist that I've seen most recently is because I have 15% scarring. Um, and to that point, uh, and, and you know, my, my hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I've uh, dilated left atrium, um, but I'm asymptomatic. I go back to the fact I'm asymptomatic. I also happen to be a pilot and a keen oh. scuba diver. So, there we are. There we are. Um, yeah. and so I'm 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 reluctant to suddenly get an ICD f because for me it's life changing in other ways. So I just wondered this difference of, opi uh, of opinion on therapy treatment. Um, it, if you are asymptomatic, it is quite a difficult pill to swallow. Yeah, absolutely. Cardiologists disagreeing with one another. I, really? <laughs> no, I think, so of course there are always going to be differences of opinion. And what, I, what I've shown you, yeah, one, this is a trial, okay, but a lot of what we say and advise around all cardiomyopathies, but particularly this one, is based upon consensus. Yeah, what we collectively think is probably the right thing to do. And of course, when you've got consensus, you're going to have a range of opinions. This business about the scar. So it, it, this has been a contentious point for some time now. If you, about 60% of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will have some scar on their muscle if you do an MRI. So my first break point is to say, does that mean that 65% of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should have a defibrillator? Absolutely not, because the overwhelming majority of those people will be at low risk. Completely unnecessary to put an ICD in on that basis alone. Are there studies showing a relationship between the presence or the amount of scar and outcomes? Yes, there are. They're not trials, they're observational studies. What's missing from most of those studies is whether or not the people who are at greater risk do or don't have any of the other risk factors. And what we know from the scar burden is that it tracks with the severity of the thickening of the muscle, with the presence of arrhythmias on the tape. So is, you know, is it telling me something that I don't already know from the other tests that we do? Now, there is a study which has been designed to try to answer this question. It's called HCMR, Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Magnetic Resonance. Um, study Europe and the United States, and I think they've recruited about 4,000 people, something like that. And the idea is to take a, group, a bunch of people with HOCOM, do MRIs, and then oops, look at the relationship between scar and risk. Now, the study's been running for about five, six years and there's no signal between the amount of scar and risk to the point where they've actually extended the study by another five years in the hope that they will see a signal. But they haven't demonstrated a, a signal yet. Now, to be fair to the study, it's by, almost by definition they've excluded some high-risk people because if you've got a defibrillator in, it's hard, if not impossible, to do an MRI scan. So those people are sort of out of the study. But my argument has been that scar alone, the, the jury is still out. So I would not put a defibrillator in simply on the basis of the, the presence of scar. Now, where it gets difficult is if it's very extensive. So if the whole heart is white out. If, as well as having scar, you've got impairment of the pump function, 
then we might start thinking about defibrillators in that context. So it has to be very individualized. But it's the problem I have with the US guidelines. Is that, you know, if, if you follow the US guidelines, it means that two thirds of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy get a defibrillator, which is just not necessary. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate uh, your chat today. My questions do with screening. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I'm unique, but um, I was diagnosed with asthma when I was 40. Yeah. Um, so the kitchen sink was chucked at my asthma, and unknown, my hockam was in in the background happening at the same time. Um, so it wasn't until I, I saw my doctor. 10 years down the line that he spotted the inverted T wave and said, oh, you've got a problem with your heart. Uh, unfortunately, by that time, I already had obstructive yeah. cardiomyopathy. So if I would have been early screened by the uh, respiratory team, it might have changed the treatment that I subsequently have. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so asthma is one of those common symptoms that people are diagnosed with before their diagnosis of HCM. Now, again, to be fair, the majority of people who go to their GP with breathlessness and wheeze have got asthma. <laughs> So it's, it's how do we get doctors, GPs to be a little bit more alert to things? And it's what, you know, I'm a bit old fashioned, but it's about taking a history. You know, do you wheeze? No, I don't wheeze. You know, blow into this machine that you can buy out of boots for 10 quid and you've got a really high peak flow. Does this person really have asthma? You know, it's a few little simple things to try to sift those out. Does everybody with breathlessness or with asthma-like symptoms need to have an ECG? No, but if you've got unexplained breathlessness, good peak flow, et cetera, then yeah, maybe you do need to have an ECG. It's not, it's not rocket science, but I know it doesn't happen. Thank you for your lovely talk. It was nice to be spoken to in plain English as well, and, and as if we're not idiots. <laughs> 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 because sometimes medical people do do that. And, but, you know, do you, they, really? Yes. <laughs> just, just, um, I mean, just, just on that point, so I, was thinking, I, was, I was reflecting um, at the beginning of today, you know, when you talked about the Cardiomyopathy, well, it was Cardiomyopathy Association then, changed its name, in 1989. I, I started my engagement with this organization in 1993 as a sort of spotty research fellow, giving talks. So we were made by my boss to come and give talks. And you very quickly learn that the, the route to disaster is to do exactly what you said, is to <laughs> treat people as though they're idiots. Because actually the kind of, you know, you're, ex, you're experts in your condition. Yeah, you know more about your condition than many doctors do, because you're N equals one, you've learned about it, you understand what it means for you. Um, but the other thing is, you, you, and, and this might come as patronizing, I really don't mean it to be patronizing, you, you ask questions that most medical audiences don't ask, because they, they think they're gonna be, they, oh, I'll look stupid if I ask that question. So you just ask the obvious intelligent question. And it keeps people like me on, on our toes because we have to learn that you know, communicate. A lot of medicine is all about communication. And communication is, a, is, is an art form you have to, have to learn. And unfortunately, a lot of doctors are, don't, have that. don't have that. No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask about uh, Mavacampton. Um, you said it was not being used in the UK, but is it being used elsewhere? And also, um, is it possible to take part in the trial, or is that? Yeah, so the trials for Mavacampton in obstruction are over now. Um, the, it's, so unless you are in the trial, you can't get onto Mavacampton at the moment. NICE will be considering it next April. I say we'll see what happens. It's, I, I think the evidence are very compelling, but you know, ultimately it's going to come down to price. So at the moment, it's, so it's got a license in the States. Um, I think it's going through the approval process in, in Europe. But as, at the moment, I think it's only the US that has it. I might be wrong, but I think it's only the US that has it. Um, there, are, there is another drug which works in a similar way called Afficampton, and there is an ongoing trial of that at the moment. Um, we are recruiting. Um, that should be completed by the spring. You know, our hope is that maybe towards the end of next year or the year after, again, if the trial is positive, that's another one that will come through. Mavacampton seems to be incredibly safe. Um, there are a few things you have to look at. Because of this um, problem with, it works by reducing contractility of the heart. So you, you have to monitor contractility really, really carefully as you are increasing the dose. There was, a, there was a curious phenomenon that happened in this trial. So there were two people in this trial 
who developed something which is called Takotsubo. Anybody heard of that? Takotsubo means octopus pot in Japanese. And there's a, there's, a, there's a very strange, sometimes it's called stress cardiomyopathy, where people are under intense emotional stress. And the, the ventricle balloons, and then within 24 or 48 hours, sort of starts to recover. And there were a couple of people with thick hearts, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where that happened. They stopped the drug, they re-challenged them with the drug, and it didn't happen again. So it remains unexplained. So that was really the only, I would say, serious thing that came out of this drug, but it was very, it was two people. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I found it a fascinating talk and very nostalgic because several <laughs> of the people you mentioned I've either been a, a, a patient of oh, or really? I'm a patient of at the okay. moment. Right. So, and also I've had several of the procedures you mentioned, so okay. it, it feels like a, almost like looking at my holiday snaps. <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to ask is it's only recently that people like yourself and Oliver Goodman and others have been talking about strokes, the possibility of strokes. Mm. And what I wanted to ask is, you know, I've had my heart scanned in all sorts of ways, MRAs, echocardiograms, I've had dye put through my arteries to see if they're thinning. Nobody's done anything on my brain you know, uh -huh. for the stroke. Now, what I'm wondering is, is it one of two things? Is it that if a stroke happens, it's, there's no precursor, there's no mm. way of seeing anything happening? Or is it that the specialists for the brain don't want the specialists of the heart intervening with their area? Um, no, it's more prosaic than that. We just haven't done it. Um, so it's, it, in people that are at risk, for example, of atrial fibrillation, sometimes if you do a brain scan, you can see evidence for small strokes which have not caused symptoms or maybe caused you know, headache or something like that. We've never done that in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, I say at the moment, it's still you know, measure the atrium and if it's big, think about anticoagulation. We, we don't have any trials of anticoagulation in HCM. We do have, I think I, I did stick it in, I think. But I, um, we've got observational studies now, uh, it's further down, where if you look at what happens in people who've got AF who do and don't receive anticoagulation, then the, then the stroke rate is much lower on people receiving anticoagulants. But it's not a trial. And no company's ever going to do a trial in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, but no, we've never done that study. I mean, it's, it's an interesting study to do because, for example, if we took people who are in what normal rhythm with big atria, and if we did a brain scan and we saw small, would we see evidence for small infarcts? Don't know. Good idea. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent talk, uh, and once again, thank you very much. Uh, what about uh, gene testing, and should I have it done? Yeah, okay, actually I, I did, I sort of anticipated that question, I was, so genetic testing, let me just get to the end here, yeah, okay. So as with any test, you have to decide why you're doing it, or we should be deciding why we're doing it. And. The ideas behind genetic tests are, I suppose, to confirm the diagnosis, um, certainly to assist in family screening, because of the, the point the gentleman made earlier is that you, know, you, you can carry the variant, but you may not express the disease until you're 20, 30, 40. So identifying individuals who are at risk of developing the disease within the family. Can we use it to help us in this you know, quest to improve our ability to predict events in the future? And the prevention of disease-related complications, and that's really, I suppose, the agenda there is the development of new therapies which are targeted at the underlying genetic abnormality themselves. Um, and I say, in terms of diagnosis, yes, I mean, you know, it can tell you what particular time, type of HCM you have. Um, that it's helpful in a small number of people who have some of these rarer things. So, for example, some of the inherited forms of amyloid, which are very rare generally. There's this, and no one's got Fabry disease in the room, have they? No, it's about half a percent of people with HCM. Again, genetic testing can help you there. Um, this is, this is the, the screening thing in families. So one of the um, challenges that all services have now, inherited cardiac services have, is that we do a lot of family screening. Uh, we identify a lot of individuals who maybe carry a genetic variant, but are got normal echoes, normal ECGs. Or we may be in a family where there is no gene, so we say to the relatives, come back every two years or three years. 
what that means is exponential growth in the number of healthy people coming to the clinic. And it's become unsustainable. So if somebody you know, is under our care, we need to see them urgently. We often don't, we don't have the slots to see them because they're full of people coming back for their regular checks. And basically, they probably don't need to be coming back. So this was a study we did to try and look at the story in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You screen the relatives and you find a genetic variant in that relative, but they have a normal echo, normal ECG. What proportion will go on to develop disease? And what you find is that after about 10, 15 years, about half will. Nothing bad happens when you're not expressing the gene. As soon as you start to express the gene, then you become prone to disease-related complications. Now, in a way, this isn't the, te this isn't the result we wanted, because it means we do need to carry on screening all those people <laughs> carrying genetic variants. But at least for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy now, we've got some idea of how often and for how long we need to screen. And the same is true for other diseases. So that's the sort of screening piece. In terms of prognosis, um, the challenge is that not only do we have whatever it is now, you know, 10, 20 different genes, but you have multiple different genetic mutations. So you're looking at thousands of possible variants. There are some signals coming through now that genes in particular, sorry, mutations in particular areas of genes do carry a poorer prognosis than others. So this is a, a model of that funny thing I showed you on the ratchet mechanism. And mutations which affect the neck of that, that molecule, beta myosin, do seem to be associated with a higher risk of sudden death. And where we're heading is looking at sort of risk, so these are survival curves, in people with individual mutations. This is active research, but we need thousands of people to be able to generate genetic risk scores. But it's, it's happening. It's happening. So it may in the future help us with prognosis. It's a different story in other cardiomyopathies. The, the association with risk and mutations is much stronger in other cardiomyopathies than it is in HCM. Um, and the treatment thing, as I say, I'll talk about later. But. So why to confirm the diagnosis, major help that genetic screening brings is in family screening. Hi. Thanks again. Um, I'm now 70, a couple of um, battery replacements. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking it's getting tougher. I'm in persistent AF. Right. Very interesting to see a slide showing an external mm. um, replacement, but also the development of drug therapy. Mm. Um, you said not necessarily within your time, but the fact that you're talking about an external... So that, that's here now. Right. That's here now, yeah. Um, should we be looking uh, at more frequent consultations <laughs> because of the development of the drug therapy? I, for the drug therapy... Awareness. I yeah. I don't think... For the drug therapy, not, not yet. Um, I mean, just keep, keep an eye on what's happening in the field. Organise... I must keep hitting this bloody microphone. The organizations like Canal the UK, you know, keep abreast of what's happening. I mean, the trials for gene therapy will be starting next year. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of at least one, maybe two companies that will be starting gingerly on this, on this route for gene therapy. It's a bit, it's, it's, there's a lot of hurdles to get over with gene therapy. So, you know, it's going to be a little while before we know. As I said uh, to the lady at the back, I mean, it may be that we do gene therapy and something amazing happens but we don't know yet. I'm going to have to wait and see. But I think just, just keep your eyes open on what's happening generally. For the SICD, that's a conversation with your specialist. If you've, got, if you've got leads which are operating perfectly normally, I wouldn't start changing the system around. Yeah. Another thank you for your talk. Um, one of the reasons I'm here, um, you very kindly screened my two daughters, sort of late teens, early 20s. Um, and it kind of leads on a bit from that. Um, and one is, one isn't carrying, and it's the commonest, the MY, BPC3. Yep. Um, so I'm also here today, sort of this looking at the future, listening out for my daughter who's carrying the gene, thinking, what can I take back? And it was interesting that um, I wasn't aware there's such a link, it looks like there's such a link with obesity. 
So obviously I can encourage her to keep her weight normal. Um, presumably, um, as I've been told as a patient, you know, exercise is really, really important. You just don't want to overdo it. Mm -hmm. um, are there other things that, I mean, obviously there's lots of things you're talking about are looking bright for her future, potentially with the mm -hmm. drugs and the surgery and so on. Is there anything else that you would say I could pass on to her as a message of, you know, uh, I'm asking an impossible question because we no. don't know the answers as to what, what might trigger her to go into disease, but yeah, what would be your advice? So I think the, the prospect is the one I've, we've started to discuss now, which is about G, um, therapies which modify the underlying disease. So rather than just treating a symptom, they actually change the way in which the heart muscle behaves in the long term. The, the drug Mavacamptan that we keep coming back to, I don't have shares in this company, by the way, but <laughs> um, the, as part of the development of that drug, there were animal experiments, mice with HCM, which are not a good model for human HCM, but if you give the drug before the development of the thickening, you can actually prevent the thickening from occurring. Gene therapy, you know, the, the logical end point to that is to say, okay, well, we've done genetic screening. This person is carrying a genetic variant. Let's get in now and cure it before you've developed thickening and scar and all that kind of stuff, which may, may or may not be reversible to a, an extent. Um, that's, I think, the final destination. It's about the ultimate in prevention, which is to cure the disease before you have any manifestations. So if gene therapy works, and if it's not associated with side effects, and if it's not two million pounds a dose, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then that, I think, is, is the thing to keep, keep an eye on for your, for your daughters. You know, we've got a genetic diagnosis. Is that going to allow us to get in early before? I didn't realize there was such a uh, different in incidence between men and women as well. If I'm right, it looks like she's got half the risk of a male equivalent. Uh, it's the, well, so if you, if you look at the prevalence of the disease so in the population, there's for some reason which remains unexplained, there's always more men than women. If you look at prognosis, actually the excess mortality above the background of the population is higher for women than it is men. Because women tend to, certainly in the younger decades, tend to have a lower risk than men generally. But if you correct for the background, actually women with HCM are at greater risk. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm actually here on behalf of my husband and my children, but um, both my daughter, my husband has the HCM, and both my daughters have, they're in their early 30s, and they've just been told that they carry the gene. Right. Um, and my eldest has just had a baby who's now about four months old. <clears throat> and when she was pregnant, as soon as they heard that she that there was HCM in the family, it all became quite stressful <laughs> between um, the hospital she was under. Um, and the baby's um, been to the Brompton and had a checkup and everything's fine at this moment, obviously, because it's a late onset gene, isn't it? But they did actually say to her, did she want the, did she want the baby gene tested? Well, <laughs> I didn't think that you did that, offered that. Yeah. So it's such a, and then she's like, "Do I go to Great Ormond Street? Because obviously, our two, we've known about the genes since 1997. So mm. our kids went into screening, which, in a way, psychologically for them, I know, had an impact being screened throughout their time. Mm. Um, so in a way, it's like, do you put a little baby through that, or what? And she doesn't know whether she should go to Great Ormond Street, stay under the Brompton. She's not sure what to do. Okay. So Juan, Juan Kasky is going to, I'm sure he'll talk about this, and he has a, a very particular philosophy about genetic testing in children. But there's, I, I would say there still is, um, amongst, the, amongst the genetics community at least, a view that one should not test in childhood unless it's going to make a difference to what you do in terms of therapy. The argument being that the, the kids can't consent in that way. So you could take your six-year-old or four-year-old or whatever, and you're doing your duty as a parent by saying, I really want to know this. So they carry a variant. Their echoes, ECGs are normal, normal, normal. They get to the age of 16, 17. And they, do you know what, Mum? 
I really don't want to know about this. And all the things about discrimination and so on, yeah, it shouldn't happen, but if the information leaks out, it, yeah, it can. So that's always been the argument. Don't test unless it's going to change what you do. Um, a counter argument is what you do may not be giving a pill, but it may be about directing your life choices. So if you know that your 14-year-old or your 12-year-old is carrying a variant, maybe it's a bit of a risk if you want to go into the army or if you want to become an airline pilot or, you know, because it, you, know, it's, you may develop the disease just as you're peaking in your career sort of thing. So I think, I think the balance is tipped towards earlier and earlier genetic testing. Um, and that's, a, again, a very individual discussion. And as long as everybody understands, it's exactly what I said about screening earlier, as long as everybody understands that there are pros and cons to screening. Um, yeah, for young children at school, yeah, if you've got HCM, yeah, it's, the, it's the poor lonely kid sitting in the middle of the assembly hall while everybody is out playing in the playground because the teachers were afraid something terrible is going to happen if they start running around. So it's, it's a complex discussion, but from my perspective, as long as everybody understands those pros and cons, it's not forbidden to do genetic testing in children. Does that answer the question? Sort of. <laughs> one more question. Uh, you asked me about Gosh or, it doesn't matter whether it's Gosh or Brompton, it doesn't really matter. We've got one more question. I am aware it has just tipped into midday. Um, will that be okay? Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then we'll I'll obviously as long go as you for a break. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for your talk. I'll try and keep it as short as possible. Um, my question is, after hearing all about this testing and obviously you even mentioning you have a lot of healthy people coming in regarding it. So my family has across at least two generations, mm -hmm. I'd say, of cardiomyopathy. I had my last ECG maybe two years ago. That came back clear. Mm -hmm. But given the prevalence of it within my family, to what extent should I really be getting on at the clinicians mm. about getting genetic testing? I think the details were taken down in regards of my family history, but that was like, what, maybe over two years ago now? Right. Heard nothing back. Do I really keep pestering them or do I not? I mean... Um, so, so no one in the family has been genetically tested at all? No. So pester. Yes, okay. <laughs> because it's the, the, the general's question about you know, why to do genetic testing. In HCM, this is, it helps try to resolve some of these uncertainties. Now, if, if a mutation isn't identified, it could still be genetic, in which case you'd continue in this sort of slightly unsatisfactory way of screening every two or three years. But if you can identify the mutation in the family, then you, know, you could be screened. To, and if you don't carry it, then that's the end of the story. But, so be a bit pushy. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we'd all like to thank you for today. It's been really informative. <laughs>